Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. There are heroes. There are role models. There are people who came before me. And the style of writing that I used for this is to make it more accessible, I think, to a younger generation. An excerpt from today's guest, who's written a book which takes you inside the lives and experiences of 15 unknown women heroes from the greatest generation. Author and retired Major General Mary Kay Eder is here, and I'll speak with her after this break. This is Point of the Spear. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest is a retired Army Major General, former commander and expert in strategic communication. She writes about communications topics, stories from the past that are relevant today. Her current book is called The Girls Who Stepped Out of the Line, and Major General Mary Kay Eater joins us now. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here for your new podcast. I'm, I'm thrilled. We're honored. And uh, before we start, you mentioned on your Amazon listing, you mentioned the book Radium Girls. Kate Moore is my editor at Osprey. Ah. So that's a small world. Two degrees of separation, not six. Absolutely. Yeah. First question I had is, it seemed to me these, that these virtually unknown women, their stories were very dramatic, the ones I was able to read. And they would make a good dramatic film uh, or a dramatic show. Did you feel the same way? I did. It, I was surprised in putting these stories together as I learned how many of them were connected to each other, even if in peripheral ways or they were in the same place at the same time. But certainly I think it would make a great series. You could start with somebody like Betty McIntosh, who was tied to Virginia Hall, knew about Virginia Hall, was in the OSS along with two of the other women who was in China working with the Jedburgh teams as they moved into the Japanese concentration camps in China right after VJ Day to make sure that the Japanese didn't execute some of the American prisoners. And one of those prisoners is a 12-year-old girl who'd spent five years in the prison camp. So certainly she was central to many of the stories here. Yeah, I could see a miniseries as well with that kind of thread. You never know where it's going to go, though, with books. You know, no, you never do. Who will have interest? You mentioned uh, in the book that as a member of the military, it stunned you that you had never heard of these courageous women or their stories. Why do you think that is? Well, certainly the study of military history is about the politics, the diplomacy, the operations, the campaigns, the generals, the battles, and the soldiers who fought them. So to talk about women who were primarily in support roles. They did everything but fight in World War II. And those who did fight were individuals who were in the resistance or who were alone and undercover as spies. So I was surprised I didn't know about them, but then the more I continue to study and learn about World War II, the more stories I find I didn't know at all anyway. And being Army, my focus has been Europe. And there's still much I don't know about the war in the Pacific. Along with that, uh, in your book, you mentioned the book from 1867. Who, who wrote that Women of the Civil War book? It's written by a man named Frank Moore in 1866. Um, and I think I mentioned that this was a retirement gift to me. So it's like many books you see, like the officer's guide that lieutenants get to read. They look at it once and put it away. So this is, this is virtually untouched. But for each of these stories, there are also pictures or lithographs, and there's literally hundreds of them, which for what I know of the Civil War, it comes down to the, the woman who was the doctor. And that's typically the story we hear. So many others have been lost to time. And even in his introduction, he talks about, well, women didn't have much of a role in the past, but not anymore. Well, I guess he needed a better marketer. So there's some things that we seem to reinvent the wheel and discover over and over. I discovered, during my recent book, Immortal Valor, there was a, a woman correspondent who was embedded 
with uh, the 104th Infantry Division. And I didn't, I didn't realize they were, you know, female correspondents embedded. And uh, her name was Ann Stringer. Have you heard of her? No. Her story, because my book is about uh, African American Medal of Honor winners, so I was, you know, combing through the history of that. But Ann had been a political affairs correspondent, and her husband Bill was killed on the first day of Normandy from a German tank. So she took his job, and she fo- and she was one of the one of the few women who were permitted to uh, follow the army wow. into Europe. And uh, I thought that was amazing. So I wanted, I included her little part of her story in my book. My college journalism professor was named Kay Ryle Miller. And she and her husband were both war correspondents in the Pacific, were on a Japanese ship when it surrendered. And one of the sailors came up, grabbed her husband, pulled a pin on a grenade and killed both of them in front of her. And she was quite a tough old cigarette smoking, hardcore editor type. So she really taught us some the rules of journalism that I still recall. Wasn't there a older woman at the Washington Post like that? <laughs> Next question I have is, I know it's early in the book's release, but what's the reaction been in and outside of the military? So the bit of reaction I have thus far is from primarily from military women who want to read it and learn from it and to say there are there are heroes, there are role models, there are people who came before me. And the style of writing that I used for this is to make it more accessible, I think, to a younger generation. Because so many people nowadays, I believe, think World War II is back there with the pyramids. Mm. You know, it's ancient history. And in reality, it's yesterday. And when you read their stories, you realize how many of them went through the same types of things that we still see happen today. They fight the same battles or they fought them first. And it's all very modern. It's not old fashioned. It is fighting bureaucracy, trying to fit in, looking for your place, trying to belong. Because I think that's what we all want is to be one of us, to belong. And so there, if there is a theme that goes through these, it's about belonging and being able to contribute. Perhaps being a part of something larger than yourself. Yes. Uh, something like World War II. Do you plan to write more of these kind of books, the undiscovered stories of, of women in the military? Or? One of my friends who, when she saw the book, said, wow, you should write about my husband's grandmother. She was one of the first police women in New York City. So I said, okay, tell me more. So apparently this woman joined the police force in 1915 and created a women's reserve because of the need for more women to serve because of World War I. So she served in the New York City Police Department from as as a police officer, a sworn officer from 1923 through World War II. So she saw it all, the 20th century from that point of view and the growth of New York City and every type of crime and political action you can imagine from doing witness protection and mafia trials to investigating serial murders Mm. to getting in street fights. And they taught them jujitsu. So she was able to take down the bad guys. So I was quite intrigued by by this story. So if I can, I want to tell it. I spent a lot of time in New York City. I can't imagine what it was like in 1915. Horses and cars, and which one is going to make it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Along with that, I know there's a military women's memorial in Arlington that I've never been to, but it looks like it's, it's wonderful. I've searched for a women's military museum, and I wasn't sure if one existed. Is there one in existence? And if not, do you think there should be? Yes, and I think this memorial in Washington is also a museum because they seek to have individual women register with them and tell their story. And they're still seeing so many people who say, well, I didn't do that much or I didn't serve overseas. But in their archives, I've spent considerable time in their archives. i bet. <laughs> they have original letters, documents, um, things that people donated to them. So there are 
lots of displays. There's a lot of history there. So I think that is the women's museum, if you will. Okay. So one of the people in the book is Stephanie Check Rader. Now, many of these people participated in the, uh, the archives or the veterans history project where they were interviewed. Sure. Well, Stephanie Rader was not discovered, discovered until 2008 when the OSS files were declassified. Then the OSS Society found her and tracked her down at her home in Alexandria, Virginia, and said, hey, weren't you? And she said, yes, she admits it. But she never told her neighbors. Um, her husband was a retired Air Force pilot and a general. So she did an interview with the Women's Memorial. It had never been transcribed. It was one of the few interviews she did. She did a couple with the OSS Society. So this past February, on the one day it snowed in Washington, mm -hmm. I was sitting in their archives with my coat on watching this video to get more of her history and her story. And it was just incredible. We'll be back to the conversation after this quick break. World War II was the most violent and destructive armed conflict in the history of mankind. Thousands of books, films, and memorials have been dedicated to the conflict. Yet one unwritten and unheralded chapter remains. The story of America's World War II glider pilots, spearheading nearly every Allied assault during the war. Oh, I have the greatest respect and admiration for the guys who sat there in the pilot seat of those gliders. Because there was such a small group of us in so many men under arms, it, it made us feel that we were kind of special. Chip on the shoulder, don't fool with us. We're glider pilots. The largest armed conflict in human history demanded all an individual soldier could possibly muster. And the American glider pilots were among the bravest individual soldiers serving on the Allied lines. While many glider veterans will humbly tell you that they were simply doing their part, they will add that the G on their wings did not stand for glider. It stood for guts. Silent Wings, the American Glider Pilots of World War II, narrated by Hal Holbrook and available on Amazon Prime. Now back to my conversation with Major General Mary Kay Eater. Your military career, you retired. Could you speak on, I know you were a commanding general, could you speak on your service a little bit before you retired? Sure. Um, my first five years in the Army were active. This was the Army after Vietnam, just after the end of the draft. This was the, the years of the Hollow Army, the changes after Vietnam, the looking to what is ahead. It was a difficult time, I think, for the Army and for the American people in looking at what and how the Department of Defense fits into the civil fabric of our society. It was a terrific learning experience for someone as young and naive as I was, even about the Army, because I was a direct commission, which means I had no background. I had no ROTC. I had a brother who served. I didn't come from a military family. So I raised my hand, said the oath, and the next day I was a lieutenant. So it was... Let's start at ground zero. But that's a fast track. <laughs> it was a fast track and some of the, the very basic things made absolutely no sense to me. What do you mean the S1 does personnel? That, that's ridiculous. It took me a, a long while to assimilate the basics, I think. And it was a difficult time for women in the military. As few as there were, it was the same type of a situation as it would have been back in, in World War II where Women were not treated well. There typically were three ways in which women were looked at. You were somebody's sister, somebody's wife, or somebody to be taken advantage of. And there were no other categories. So if you wanted to have a certain job in order to progress, well, you'd be taking a job away from some man trying to support his family. I was very frustrated with the active army at that time. So I left, I joined the reserves. And the reserves is, it is, but it isn't. <laughs> it's just very different. 
And I don't mean that in a good way or a bad way. It is just different enough and it is much more inclusive in many ways. I enjoyed the reserves. I was in the reserves in Virginia. I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I'm not from Virginia. So we would have retreats or conferences. Some of them would be at VMI because many graduates from VMI joined the reserves in Virginia and they would make VMI jokes that would go over my head. And I had no idea what, what that meant. We, we attended a parade at VMI and our general said, well, I guess it rained on your parade because I'm a hokey. And everyone laughs and I'm the only one there going, what is a hokey? <laughs> what does that mean? So it was another cultural change. So I think coming back into the active service after 9-11 was totally different. This is an army that has been transformed by becoming a truly values-based institution, by adhering to those values, by developing a code, you know, the soldier's creed, by doing all of these things meant to creating a overall, I think, influence on all of its 1.2 million members as to how we look forward, we move together, we take care of each other, and we meet the mission. While the institution takes care of those who serve and their families. So I have a great deal of faith and trust in this institution where it is now. That's good to hear. Were you, uh, did you go back voluntarily or were you called into active service? After 9-11, I was working in Germany as a civilian at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies, which teaches the basic principles of democracy to the former Soviet states. And my reserve time was at the U.S. European Command headquarters. So my colleagues said to me, do you think you'll get recalled? And I said, no, I'm too old and I'm too high up. So it was two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks later, I had the orders, and by November, I was back on active duty. I was uh, actually in New York on 9-11. Oh. That was uh, a day, a strange day that I will never forget. I wrote up the story on my blog so that I wouldn't forget it. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a boat off the island. Wow. Yeah, the circle line. But nobody knew what was happening. It was just the strangest feeling. It just, nobody knew. There was, there was nothing. There was no information. Nothing. No, there was, I remember that so well, because we all watched it. We could watch it live on um, CNN International mm -hmm. from the offices. But once you went home, it wasn't on German television. No, it wasn't. I'm surprised. It just in small bits on the evening news. And Germany, or at least in Bavaria, where I live, they were, let's get back to being German. So there weren't that many English channels. I see. And if I wanted to watch the BBC or try to watch CNN at home, it was blue. The screen was blue, so they didn't want you watching. So it was back to the office where we all spent most of the next week just trying to, as you said, understand what had happened. Yeah, being, being in the moment that day, we were waiting till, till, to get some kind of word from something. And cell phones didn't work. My... Um, my wife had to email me to ask me if everything was okay because no cell phones worked. Yes. Most people don't remember that. And I, we, I was in a control room. I was actually doing the People's Court television show and <laughs> back in my television days. And we watched Channel 4 News. We saw the, the second plane actually hit the tower no. when the reporter was in front of it. And then... A few minutes later, the word came down that the, the plane had hit the Pentagon. And that's when we were released out into the streets and said, they told us, get home, get, get home safe. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so four months later, I am back in the States and I'm back at the Pentagon now working, now recalled to active duty again, working for the Department of Defense. And I'm in a carpool with four guys who were there on 9-11. So day one, they said, we have to teach you four different ways to go home. <laughs> so they showed me all the different routes. They made sure I had a backpack in my car that had in it the blanket, the water, a compass, some matches, you know, things you might need in Washington. So, 
And I still have it. So I still have all of that in my car, just in case you never know. You never know. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I adopted that, that kind of feeling. You never know after going through that. You never know what's going to happen. You just have to roll with it. And no matter how you prepare, you will be wrong. But at least you've got done something. Yeah, I agree. I think the smartest thing I did that day was when I was walking over to 12th Avenue to the Circle Line, I saw it, I was walking away from Penn Station. They had closed it. Nobody knew it was closed. But I was actually on a train, and they told us to get off. Ah. Uh. So everyone was coming down to Penn Station, and they didn't know it was closed. So I was going the opposite direction. And I looked at a deli, and I said, I think ATMs are probably not going to work pretty soon. So I went into a, a deli and got as much cash out as I could, you know, and then continued on to the, to the, to the boat. But it was like every person for themselves. In some ways, I was sorry that they stopped showing the footage of what happened in New York. I understand how difficult that is for families to see, but I don't, but I think we forget if we don't see it. I agree. We're coming up on the, the 20th anniversary, mm -hmm. which is hard to believe. Hopefully they'll make it uh, an honorable commemoration. I'm sure they will. I know there will be at the Pentagon. My office was is right beside the Pentagon Chapel. Mm -hmm. So outside the door there is where there is the Pentagon Memorial. But in that chapel are, is the memorial to all of those who lost their lives that day on the plane and inside the Pentagon. And when I worked there, I met someone who had been in the Army Personnel Office that day. And he took me up to their hallway and if you'd like to see this, I'll send it to you. It's a map that's on the wall there showing the path of the plane mm. between corridors three and four, where it hit. <clears throat> he said, now I want you to look at all of the, because it shows every desk and every person. He said, I was sitting here. So you can see where it knocked me out of my chair and onto the floor. And most of, most of us would went back to help others. But take a look at all the white spots here. These are people who weren't there that day or suddenly had the urge to go get a Coke and left. And he said, you can see the hand of God in this with all of the people who were not there and how much worse it could have been. I would love to see that. You know, well, you have to give me your email, so I will send it to you. I will. There are many stories about the Twin Towers like that as well. Mm -hmm. people, people have told me stories that they were actually supposed to be there for some reason. Yeah. yeah, the chief of the Naval Reserve, his office was, you know, four decks up from ours, mm -hmm. but he would bring in Navy, Navy admirals and lecture them on, this is where I, I was flying. It was when it was his friend piloting the plane that hit the Pentagon that day. Mm -hmm. So he would tell them from his perspective, this is where the wing was. This is where the body of the plane was. This is exactly how it happened. Because if you go there now and you hear the Pentagon tour being given by an 18-year-old soldier, it sounds very far in the past and very dry and not emotional. And so to have the connection to something like this, and I think that's true for all of these stories, to have a connection, you have to feel the emotion of what the people who were there then felt and what they went through. I agree. And we we can never lose that history. I hope they do something this September that's worthy of it. I really appreciate your being here, General Eater. The book is called The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. And Mary Kay, thank you so much for being here. This has been wonderful. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be Bob Welsh, author of Saving My Enemy, how two World War II soldiers fought against each other and later forged a friendship that saved their lives. Saving My Enemies, of all the World War II books I've written, I think it is the one that gets most deeply to the experience of a soldier, to the post-war pain of a soldier, and in this case, to the reconciliation of two soldiers, a German and American, basically saving each other's lives late in their life after after 50 or 60 years of uh, terrible PTSD. That's next time. And stay up to date with all the upcoming guests. 
sign up for the Point of the Spear pipeline at robchild.net. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join. It just takes seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, then complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today, and thank you for your support.